are continuing our series that we have entitled Partnering Together for the Gospel. Partnering Together for the Gospel. And, you know, last week, again, we talked about letting Christ's mind be in us and thinking of each other above ourselves and putting others, more, making them more valuable than ourselves and more important than ourselves. All these incredible things. And we get to verse 14 today, verses 14 through 18, and you hear Paul uh, interacting and uh, just kind of pleading with the people in uh, Philippi, as wonderful as the Philippian church was, listen, they're like every church. There's problems, sometimes between people, sometimes uh, between staff. Listen, there's just going to be times when those things happen. And Paul says, listen, you can rise above that. We can't escape it. We can't avoid imperfections. We, none of us could be perfect. And a church can't be perfect, but you know what? We need to make it as much like heaven on earth as we possibly can to have true love for each other. And Paul says to them here in chapter 2, verse 14, do all things. Think of him pleading with a church family. Y'all, do all things without complaining and disputing. Stop arguing. And here we have those wonderful henna clauses. I sure wish they would put so <laughs> with along with that. So that, for this purpose, quit complaining and disputing for this purpose, that you may become blameless and harmless. Notice that you may become. They weren't that right then. But he wants them to become that. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You know what? You're, you're a light. You are, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. But sometimes you know what? It's like a windshield. If you don't wash it, that windshield gets a little bit murky, a little bit hard to see through. Same thing. Our light can't shine as beautifully if there's arguing and disputing and you know, not getting along. Then Paul continues here, don't be arguing, complaining, because you need to be holding fast. This is the next slide here. You need to be holding fast, holding firm the word or the message of life, the good news. You need to hang on to the good news. So, notice this that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I've not run in vain or labored in vain. He says, Philippians, I want you to hold firm to that good message because I don't want to stand before the Lord and not be rewarded for all the things I did, and so on and so forth. And then he says, he says, verse 17, yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice in service of your faith. He's going back kind of to an Old Testament picture there. If I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. If we go back four years ago to March of 2018, the Portland Trailblazers basketball team was not doing well at all. In fact, one of their premier stars, Mo Harkless, was doing so poorly at this point in March of 2018 that the coach just said, hey, I'm going to sit you tonight. I'm going to sit you. You're going to sit on the bench. Think about the premier player Old Dirk Nowitzki of the, think of Dirk Nowitzki getting benched or LeBron James on L.A. getting benched. You know, Mo was cream of the crop, man. He was at the top. And you know what? The coach puts him on the bench like a second or third stringer for the whole game. Ouch. <laughs> so, believe it or not, as it usually happens, right? 
The team's doing terrible, but they take the star out, and what happens that night when the star's sitting the bench? Man, the trailblazers come alive. You know those guys that never get to play? They're out there. They're pounding in three-pointers. The bench is going crazy. I love when the, the non-starters go crazy on the bench. Man, they're waving the towel. They're cheering. Man, they, that bench was doing that that night. Well, all of the bench except for <laughs> Mo Harkless. <laughs> yeah. What happened was he was not happy that he got benched. And the next day, if you watch the replay of the game, you could see the entire bench going crazy, cheering the team on, except for Harkless, who stayed in his seat. I don't know how I found that picture of Mo Harkless, but it is him, and it fits perfectly for what I'm saying. <laughs> but he's sitting on the bench, dejected, listless, angry, and the next day, when he watched the game and saw what he looked like, he realized, wow, I need to do something about that. I need to do something about that. So he got the coach's permission, and at the next team practice, he apologized. He apologized to the entire team. He apologized to the entire team the next day at practice. And he said to the journalists who interviewed him that it didn't matter that he got benched. He said, you know, what I did was wrong. And this is what he told the journalists. He said, no matter what's going on, I can't be a bad teammate. Those are still my guys. They're my teammates. They're my compatriots. I need, if they're cheering and happy, I need to be cheering and happy. If they're down and sad, I need to be down and sad with them. All right, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. They were rejoicing, and I was weeping over my own bad play. I'm the one that should have got benched, but here I am, mul uh, uh, sulking and, you know, dejected. Now, you need to know the end of the story. <laughs> I love this. The end of this. Oh, hang on. We need to pray. I hear the church. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. All right. All right. I gotta, I've got to sometime put the video up of the church. Somebody, some church made this video, and it's the funniest video. It's got, I told you this before, it shows somebody playing video games in the pew, and it says, if you play video games during church... You will, and, and the penalty falls on, you know, here's the teenager, and the penalty falls on him, and he's like, you will have your phone taken away till after the service. And then there's three different layers, but then they get to the final layer, and it says, if your phone rings during church, and it shows this man and his wife, they're all standing in the back, kind of in the back row, and the man's phone goes off, off and he goes, no! It says, if your phone goes off during the pastor's sermon, you will be relegated to the lake of fire. And the guy goes, no! And the big boom, this flame goes up and he's gone. And the family's like, ah! <laughs> so just remember that next time, okay? If you, if you don't want to be relegated to the lake of fire. <laughs> okay, the end of the story. What's the cool end of the story? Portland comes together. Mo Harkless apologizes. Not too long after that, guess what happens to Portland? They go on a 13-game winning streak. Wow. The power of unity. The power of getting along. The power of having one heart and one soul and one mind. Unity makes all the difference in the world. It makes all the difference in the local church. And it makes all the difference in our homes and in our families and in our marriages. Unity is so important. Does it mean, okay, it's not uniformity. Every one of you have to be just like me. You have to dress like me, think like me. No, it's not uniformity. It's unity. 
We're all different, and yet we come together as one for the glory of God Almighty. And so this unity is what I want to speak to you about for a few minutes this morning. And here is the title of today's message, The Importance of Christian Unity, all right? And I think this one should be a little bit shorter than normal, but with me, you never can tell. It might actually be twice as long. So, well, anyway, let's pray together, all right. Father, Lord, I, I love our church. I love your people, Lord. And God, I just pray that they'll hear your voice, beckoning them, correcting them, encouraging them. God, use this in their lives, their children. Be glorified, Father. And we pray this in your precious name. Amen. All right. There was a writer for NPR. She's an NPR commentator as well. Her name was Heather King. She's a former alcoholic. But you know what? Heather King came to Christ. She came to Christ. And after she was saved, she wrote a blog one day about what it was like to start coming to church just after she had gotten saved. Okay, so here she is, a brand new believer. She, she is uh, in a brand new environment. You know, this is just not the people she hung around with. And this is what she said. This is what she wrote in that blog. My first impulse was to think, I don't want to get sober. Or in the case of the church, I don't want to worship with these nutcases or boring people or people with different politics, tastes and different tastes in music, food, books, or whatever. She wrote, nothing shatters our egos like worshiping, worshiping with people we did not handpick. The humiliation of discovering that we are thrown in with extremely unpromising people, people who are broken, misguided, wishy-washy, out for themselves, people who are us. But we don't come to church to be with people who are like us in the way we want them to be. We come because we have staked our souls on the fact that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and the church is the best place, the only place to be. We come because we'd be hard-pressed to say which is the bigger of the two scandals of God, that he loves us or that he loves everyone else. Now again, as I said earlier, last week we looked at what having the mind of Christ as a church was all about. Humility, regarding others better than ourselves, being concerned about their interests. The Philippians are an amazing church family, but they still need to go higher spiritually to work out their own spiritual deliverance with fear and trembling, with God's help, to work it out. He said, look, you're here. You need to be delivered to here spiritually. Okay, that verse, we, we've talked about it in the past, Philippians 2.12 has nothing to do with eternal salvation. He's saying, hey, uh, you need to work out this deliverance. You don't have it. Yes, you're God's people, but you don't have what I'm talking about here, Paul said. So you need to work out. And what, what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about, for instance, this mind of Christ and having his mind and having this unity as a body. All these things in Philippians here that surround this in the context. Okay? So what exactly did Paul say to them so this could happen? Well, we're going to go right through verses 14 to 18. And so we're going to start with verse 14. Okay? And he says there, do all things without complaining and disputing or arguing. When you get to Philippians chapter 4, two of Paul's most faithful co-workers in Philippi, two ladies named Yodia and Syntyche, I told you that one time that Warren Wearsby called them odious and soon touchy. Odious and soon touchy. Yeah. But anyway, they... They were, listen, Paul was putting them on like the top shelf as people who labored with him in the message of life. 
getting the gospel out. But guess what? Paul heard through the grapevine, he's in jail, but he hears through the grapevine from Epaphroditus that, hey, listen, you know what, Paul, pray for Yodi and Syntyche. You remember them, right? Oh, yeah, Yodi and Syntyche, yeah, they were awesome. Not so much now, Paul. Pray for them, Paul. And so Paul, when he writes this letter, he includes their names, and he says, Yodi and Syntyche, be of the same mind in the Lord. Be of the same mind. They couldn't get along. Now they're at odds. It's affecting the church. I'm going back to Warren Wearsby. When I was a brand new Christian, I heard him say this. I got a bunch of cassette tapes of his. Instead of going out partying on Friday and Saturday night, I sat in my mom and dad's basement where my bedroom was down there. And I put those tapes on and I would just scribble notes. Just grow, grow, grow. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, 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 <laughs> the old song says. If you don't do that, you'll shrink, 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 all right? And I know as you look at me, you're wondering, yeah, you've been doing plenty of shrinking, Bob. Well, I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually, all right? All right? But Warren Wearsby on one of those tapes, he got up and started his sermon off with these words. He said, and I said this a few weeks ago, to live above with saints we love will certainly be glory. To live below with saints we know, well, that's another story. Yeah. Paul wanted God's people to get along, not for the sake just of getting along, but for a specific purpose. Remember the henna clause in Greek? So that. Uh, he says in verse 14, quit arguing. Verse 15, so that... For this purpose, in order that you may become, there it is, deliverance from here to here. So you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. When we walk in harmony with both God and one another, we become the kind of people that God can use to make an impact for Jesus. Okay, when we become, when we walk in harmony with God and with each other, we can become the kind of people that can make an impact. Let's look at this. First, how do we become people of impact? Okay, first, we've got to be blameless. Did I get the right one there? What happened? Oh, yeah, there it is. Blameless, okay? This means without fault. It means... Not sinless, but like a person of exceptional character, okay? You know, if somebody says, man, that guy, you can't blame that guy. You can't pin anything on that guy. You can't pin anything on that lady, okay? They're without blame. Question, does that mean they're perfect? No, but they're, they're, they're a notch above, okay? There's something different about them, okay? The person around, the people around this person have little or nothing bad they can say about him or her. You know, they'll have to admit, yep, they're way, be, they're way down the road from me. That's what Paul's talking about here. Second, harmless. He says, quit arguing so you can become harmless. And what that means, it's really cool, it means without mixture. You're not like oil and water on the inside. You're not like purity and impurity. Now again, Martin Luther said, and especially men, listen carefully, he said, uh, he said it's one thing, you know, to be tempted to lust after women, but it's another thing to do it, okay? And so he said, Martin Luther said, um, uh, it's one thing for a bird to land on your head. It's another thing to let him make a nest there. Okay, you get the idea? So, men, what, what should we do in that, in that sense? Okay, so we're not a mixture of filth and purity. What we do is you can't ex help but be tempted. It's part of life on earth. Okay, it's part of life. Temptations come in your mind. Boom, get away. You shoo them away by the grace of God. You know what? And if you get used to doing that, you'd be amazed at how wonderfully that works where you're not sitting there struggling and struggling and struggling you know you know stuff comes on television 
click. Change channels and then revisit it after that's done, okay? You've got to do that. You've got to be pure. Be pure. Be harmless, okay? Uh, a person who isn't a mixture of good and evil. And again, we're not talking about a sin, sinless person, but a person whose life is characterized by purity rather than filth, or a mixture of the two. All right? Now, third here, in this verse 15, we've got children of God without fault. Okay? Without fault. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Now, what do we got here? Okay, that without fault. <laughs> in other places, what's, inter what, what's interesting is it's the word blameless. But when they took the sacrificial lamb in the Old Testament, question, could that sacrificial lamb have like an eye that's been poked out? Could it have three legs? Could, could, it, could they use a lamb that has three legs? No. Uh, could they use a lamb that only has one ear? No. It has to be blameless. Okay? It's got to be no fault. Okay? So, uh, if we're going to wear the name of Christ before others, if we're going to wear his name, hey, I'm a believer and I'm not ashamed of it. If we're going to wear the name of Christ and we're going to share the name of Christ, then we need to be pe people who bear the likeness of Christ, the faultless Lamb of God. Okay? That's what he means when he says, children of God without fault. Don't be like, you know, it says, um, Romans 12, 1, uh, it talks about, uh, let's see, I beseech you, I beg you, my beloved, my, I beg you, my brethren, according to the mercies of Christ, that you would present yourself a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual worship. Okay. Think about that. Present yourself a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice, a lamb that the blood's been drained out. I want you to be uh, alive and wearing Christ's name and bearing Christ's name and sharing Christ's name and without harm, okay? Without, I'm sorry, without fault. Don't be like, you know, God doesn't want us like maybe it happened in the Old Testament. All the farmer had was a scraggly lamb that was not beautiful at all. And since it was symbolizing Jesus, they would bring that crummy lamb in and they'd have to reject it. If you watch The Chosen, you've seen that where they had these lambs that were rejected. If we're not different than the people around us who need Jesus, okay, think. If we're not different than the people around us who need Jesus, if our lives are a mess, if we're a mixture of good and evil, one day pure, one day filthy, if we have all kinds of spiritual sores that make people hold their noses, they, they look and they say, say to themselves, wow, that guy talks the talk, but he doesn't walk the walk. Okay? Why, why would people want what we have? <laughs> why would they be drawn to us and to Jesus if, if that's the condition of our lives. We are just the same as the crooked and perverse people all around us. And you know what? That can't be, everybody. We've got to be different. We've got to be uh, holy unto God, set apart. As God's holy people, we are to shine, verse 16 says, we are to shine as lights in the world. Okay? We're to shine. All right? Um, we are to be spiritual 100-watt bulbs, okay? Not 5-watt nightlights. We're to be 100-watt bulbs, shining brightly. But if we lack these qualities we've just gone over, these four qualities in verse 15, we we're gonna, we'll be like... Five watt night lights. Okay, and that's why Paul said to this church, going back to verse 12, work out your all's deliverance. Y'all work out your deliverance. You're right here spiritually. You're complaining. You're arguing. You're disputing. Work it out. Okay? Do what you have to do with God's help to get from here in here. Help, have God rescue you. You're over here drowning, and you need to be rescued and brought over here to the shore of spirituality.
all right? Get back with the program. Become what God wants you to become, and he'll give you the help, all right? How important is unity and harmony? I want to put Jesus' prayer for the disciples that were with him in Gethsemane that night that were, you know, unfortunately they were falling asleep. But his prayer for them, and, uh, and by the way, we're included. Did you know that Jesus prayed for you and I in his prayer? Okay, listen to John 17. It's a long passage, but I'm going to read it because I want you to listen to what Jesus is praying for us. Think about the importance of Christian unity. Jesus is praying to his Father, and he says, Father, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. Why? Why does Jesus want us to be one? That the world may believe that you sent me. Hey, when he sees people, Christians not getting along, he says, Psh. the world says, man. And the glory, Father, which you gave me, I have given them. That they may be one, just as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that, there it is again, and these are both henna clauses as well, so that, and so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. All right, so I've given you three of these qualities so far, but there's another quality that we talked about earlier just a little bit. It's in verse 16. He says, if you want to be an impact player for Jesus, be harmless, be blameless, and he says here, hold fast or hold firmly to the word, lagos, the message of life. Hold fast to the message of life, the gospel. Don't, don't uh, go down the tubes on what you believe about how a person has eternal life. Don't turn from what I've taught you, Paul's saying. Salvation by grace, through faith, not of works, in Christ alone. By faith, by grace, through faith in Jesus. Okay? Don't ever turn from it. You get a firm grip. Stand fast holding the word of life. We're to hold firm to this message. We're not to lose grip. Start giving out a wobbly gospel that confuses people and doesn't offer them any assurance at all. No, we're giving a gospel out that offers people assurance that they have eternal life. Okay? So you say, Pastor Bob, you know, how, how, do I, how should I give the gospel out? Well, people need information. They need content. Okay? You don't just say some nebulous thing like, oh, it's easy. Just ask Jesus into your heart. That is so mystical and, and, you know, it's so confusing. First of all, the Bible never says that ask Jesus into your heart. <laughs> Not once. When Jesus gives the gospel, when Paul gives the gospel, when the apostles are out giving the gospel, you know, you don't see Paul, you know, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Ask Jesus into your heart. That's not what it says. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Why can't we give out the gospel that the Bible has in it? You know? You know what? If you'll just memorize John 5.24 or John 3.16, I love John 5.24. I have it memorized. I don't even have to look in, on my phone or in a, you know, like a Gideon Bible, a little New Testament. I can just share that with, per, with a person. Um... He who hears my words and believes in the one who sent me. Now, people get hung up about that sometimes. They say, hey, why did Jesus in that verse say, believe in the one who sent me? Because Jesus said, everything I say, John 12, 50, and in several other places, everything I say, the Father commanded me to say. 
So if you're believing in me, you're believing in the one who sent me because he gave me the very things to say. So don't get hung up on that. To believe the Father is to believe Jesus. To believe Jesus is to believe the Father. That's simple. It's not complicated. Uh, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death but has passed, has passed, has passed from death into life. Right there. You talk about an assuring message, okay? If you believe the message of Jesus, you have eternal life. You have it that very moment. He who believes my word has. Didn't say you're going to get it. Doesn't say you persevere in good works and in faith till the very end of your life to see if you made it. Hallelujah. Hey, how many of you are glad that you're not waiting for the day of your death to find out from Jesus whether you made it or not? How many of you are happy about that? Man. And yet everybody, tons and tons of Christians are taught that every Sunday. Well, you know what? You, you walk by faith and you live a good life and you do good works and good deeds. And you know what? Hopefully... Everything will work out okay. You know what? That's horrible. It's heresy. It's heretical. It's evil to tell people things like that because that's not the Bible. It's not the gospel. Jesus says, whoever hears my word, believes it, has everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but it has passed from death to life. Present, future, past. All three tenses. They're just not in, pre- they're not in past, present, future. But you have present, has everlasting life, shall not future come into judgment. You'll never stand before Jesus to determine your eternal destiny. That's history. Your eternal destiny is history. It's settled. Whoever believes has. Hey, if you, if you have everlasting life, Jesus says whoever believes has it. Okay, you have it that moment you believe. You have it immediately, at the moment of faith. If you have everlasting life, question, how long if he gives, if you, he gives you something that's eternal, how long will you have that? Eternal, you'll have it forever. How people can twist the gospel into this, you got to keep on enduring, or the ones that say, you, you can have eternal life, but then you lose it. How can you... How can you have something that's eternal and then you lose something that's eternal? No, if you have something that's eternal, you have it for how long? Forever. Okay. Okay. Whether you're the greatest Christian who walked the face of the earth or whether you're a reprobate. Now you say, Pastor Bob. Yeah, what I'm saying is the truth. You can be a reprobate and enter the kingdom or you could be a sold out believer and enter the kingdom. But here's the difference. This person who sold out to Jesus, they have all kinds of rewards dumped on them by Almighty God. This person over here, who hears what the Lord said in the parable, you wicked and lazy servant. Well, I'm going to come to that. I've, I have a slide for that. But anyway, I wanted, to, I wanted just to tell you in a minute, a simple way of sharing the gospel with others is memorize John 5.24 and explain it to the person until you see the light go on. Until you say, yes, I get it. Whoever believes in him has eternal life. Hallelujah. Okay, you just keep doing that. And if you ask him a question, you say, well, Joe, do you, do you, now do you know that you have eternal life? Ah, I don't know. Back up 10 yards and punt. Okay, go back to the beginning and start over. Okay, you get the idea. Okay, now let's wrap this up. Okay, in verse 16, Paul says to the people, hold firmly to the gospel of grace so that (laughs) I may rejoice in the day of Christ. Philippians, hold tight to the true message of grace because I really want to rejoice. I don't want to stand before God and him say, hey, uh, Paul, there's that church you started in Philippi, but guess what? 
they all let, lost their grip on the gospel. They turned into the biggest bunch of complainers and arguers, and they didn't have the right gospel. They started preaching a false gospel. Okay. He does not want to hear that before Jesus. And that's what, I don't want to hear that either for you all. I want to hear you, I want you to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, and I want to hear it myself, okay? And he says, uh, hold firmly to the gospel so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. What's the day of Christ? That's the day that ju the judgment seat of Christ when Jesus is looking at our life to see how, how well we will be rewarded. It has nothing to do with where we're going forever. It has to do with well we, well we have little, medium, or many returns. You get the idea. Small rewards, medium rewards, big rewards. That's the day of Christ. He wants to rejoice in that day. He wants to be like, yes, yes, because he glorified God. For me to live as Christ, to die is gain. He wants gain. But he says, I'm not going to get the gain I, I could get if you guys keep messing around and fighting. Okay? So he doesn't want to run in vain, and he doesn't want to labor in vain. Okay? So he's got two qualities there of fighting the good fight, running the good race. It's, it's a race. It's, it's, a, it's work. It's labor. He wanted his work to count for God. He wanted God's people to shine. Okay. Like I said... Mark it down. It's in the parable, Jesus told. Some people are going to hear these. Now, it's, well, I shouldn't say people. Some Christians. Some born-again, blood-washed, forever-saved Christians are going to hear these words from the Lord Jesus. And it's no bueno. Okay? You wicked. Okay, let's stop there. Okay, this Christian. Pastor Bob, Christians can't be wicked. <clears throat> What side of the planet did you wake up on this morning? Okay. If you were wicked, why, why come and learn God's word? I mean, you'd already be doing it. Okay, you get the idea. Hey, listen. Wicked, this person, you know what? You know what? Their life was characterized by evil. By evil. That's why he called him wicked. Because he really couldn't call him, you know, a godly you know, you good and faithful serve, and they don't hear good and faithful, they hear wicked and lazy, and then lazy, lazy, ouch, okay? The person, the guy loves sin, and he loves doing nothing for God's kingdom. He's lazy, okay? No work, no prayer, no giving, or very little, and the list can go on and on and on and on, okay? Okay, listen, you might be tricking everybody else around you about your spirituality. Like you may be in church every week, but you know what? You could be lazy and wicked. And the only one that knows it is God. And everybody else thinks, wow, you're pretty awesome. Like the Pharisees. Jesus says, you know what? You're like a tomb that's just been painted. <laughs> just somebody took a coat of white paint and it's gleaming, and it looks so beautiful. But you know what, Pharisees? You look great on the outside, but you're inside. You're full of dead men's bones. Man, man, we have to listen to God, everybody. So Paul wants to rejoice in the day of Christ. He wants the people he serves to rejoice in the day of Christ. And in the last two verses, Paul adds these words. He says, yes. And if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Now, this sounds like Paul is talking about his possible future martyrdom, being poured out as a drink offering, right? It sounds like, oh, Paul must be talking about he's going to be poured out as a drink offering. No. No, because look carefully. I, I think I can get the laser working. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering. That's present tense. Paul says, look, if right now I'm being poured out as a drink offering on your behalf, he says, uh, on the sacrifice and service of your faith, or you could say for it, 
Philippians, if I'm being poured out like an Old Testament offering for your sacrifice, for your service of faith, I'm glad and I rejoice with you. I'm happy to suffer for your sake. Unto you it is given, Philippians 1, 29, in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Paul says, I'm happy to suffer for your sake and to be poured out in that kind of life. I've been, I have been suffering, I am suffering, I will be suffering, and I'm doing it for you and for the glory of God. Verse 18, for the same reason, Philippian believers, I'm being poured out for you. I want to one day rejoice in what I did for Jesus. I want you to rejoice as well. And if I'm pouring out my life that your faith might, might prosper, I'm thrilled. And I want you to be thrilled as well. That's kind of what the last two verses they were talking about. They're kind of nebulous. They're kind of, kind of mysterious. And they're not easy to follow. But that's kind of what Paul's saying there. Okay, final story and we're done. All right. Catherine, can you go tell Miss Terry that we're going to we're going to uh, have, uh, we'll be out there in another five or ten minutes. Probably five, five minutes. Be ready. Okay. I love this story. I don't know if you know who this guy is. He played for the Baltimore Orioles for 20 years. Anybody know who this guy is? Who is it, Rob? Cal Ripken Jr. Cal Ripken Jr. Very good. His nickname? Iron Man. The Iron Man. All right. Why'd they call him the Iron Man? Because he broke, I believe it was uh, one of my old, old favorite players back in the 50s. I wasn't alive then, but I read his biography when I was in high school, and I fell in love with uh, Ted Williams. And in fact, Sears and Roebuck, you know, the company that there's no stores left anymore anywhere, Sears and Craftsman Tools, oh my goodness. Anyway, Sears and Roebuck, they uh, had... Ted Williams everything. Ted Williams weights. I had a weight set that had Ted Williams name on him and all that. Well, Ted Williams, I believe, he, he, um, he played in 2,060 straight games. But I think that's right. Rob, is that right? Was it Ted Williams? I think that's right. But anyway, but, and by the way, he died of Lou Gehrig's disease. Or not, not Lou Gehrig. That's who it is. Not Ted Williams. I'm not, not Ted Williams. Ted Williams was awesome, but he went off to war. I forgot that. Yeah, he, he didn't do... Lou Gehrig, another amazing, amazing all-star player, 20s, 30s. He, he did... Uh, he had what they've named after him. He had uh, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. He did 2,060 games in a row and... Um, Cal Ripken played 20 years for the Orioles. He did 2,061, broke the record, and then went on to be in a lot more games. Okay, he played for 20 seasons, 1983 to 2003, and played for the same team. He shared the following story. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. A lot of people ask this, ask Cal Ripken, I'll wait till you're ready to listen. Okay. A lot of people ask, what was your greatest play? Your greatest accomplishment? I say, I caught the last out of the World Series. It wasn't a great catch. I didn't dive. I didn't do a cartwheel and throw the... When you're ready to listen, I'll be ready to speak. When you're ready to stop talking, I'll be ready to speak. Thank you. Okay. I've never had to do that. In my <laughs> well, maybe I have, but anyway. Okay. Cal Ripken said, I caught the last out of the World Series. It wasn't a great catch. I didn't dive. I didn't do a cartwheel. I didn't throw out a guy at first base. People's mouths didn't drop open on the play. We all want to be part of something bigger, but we have our little jobs that we have to do as a member of a team. 
Everybody has their individual responsibilities, but they all have to come together for a main goal, and that's to win. I've had years as a player, and we haven't won, and they've not been really fulfilling, okay? I've had great years as a player when we haven't won, and they have not been really fulfilling. And I've had not so great years, but we've had a good success as a team, and they were more fulfilling. Okay, so listen carefully. So, the most fulfilling moment I could ever have, again, was catching the last out of the World Series, knowing that we did it. We did it. Notice, we. That's what he was emphasizing. He said, you know what? As great as it is to set this record, I, I was in tw 2,061 games. I set records. Hey, nothing can compare. Nothing can compare with winning a World Series as a team. Yeah, I caught the last ball, but it wasn't even a great catch. I just caught a ball. We won as a team. Okay? So, let's, let's bring this all together now. Okay? Let's bring this together. So what we've got here is the importance of Christian unity. What we've got here is God wants us to be on the same team. Okay? Partnering for the good news. Okay? Being together. Being on the same page. Not arguing and bickering and so on and so forth and, and, and at each other's throats. Okay? He says, I want you to get along. I want you to glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And the way we do that is being a team, working together as we try to get the gospel out to as many people, shining as lights in the world. All right? Well, I'm going to pray. I'm going to not only pray for all of you, I'm going to pray for our meal to follow. And hopefully it'll be ready. If it's not, we might get in there and have to wait a few minutes. But I'll go ahead and pray for that as well. And I'm going to pray for this coming week for you all that you'll have an excellent week. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, we all come to you, Lord, as your children. And Father, we pray that, Lord, you would help us in the matter of teamwork. We need each other, every one of us. We've all got different spiritual gifts. Lord, everyone is important. Everyone has a job to do. And so, Father, we come to you as your people, and we ask you, Father, to help us as the church named Ridge Point Fellowship. Help us, Lord, to love like you love, to, to help like you helped all the things, and to have hearts that are together. Lord, in, in October, we're going to be having a giant festival, Lord. We're going to have a giant uh, outreach to this neighborhood all around us. Lord, we had a meeting this past week. Father, put your hand on that. We're going to need a lot of people doing a lot of different little things that are all going to well up into one wonderful festival, Lord, for our neighbors all around us and for our children as well. So, Father, help us, bless us. Lord, I pray a blessing on your people that are here seated. Lord, I pray that you'll be with them this week in a powerful way, Lord, your, your power working through them. Lord, I pray that maybe they'll get an opportunity to give the good news. Lord, I pray that you'll give them strength to just share that Jesus gives eternal life. And he gives it right now. He gives it the moment a person believes. They don't have to wait till they die. So many things, Father. Put your good hand on your people. Bless the food we're about to eat now, Lord, at this uh, wonderful lunch. And thank you for everyone that brought something, Lord. And Jesus, we also pray for those who are watching from afar, Lord. So many people on vacation. So many people out of town. And God, we ask, Lord, for you to... Please uh, bless those that are not here with us uh, personally, Lord. And we pray all these things, Jesus, in your precious name and for your sake. Amen.